Well, good morning and welcome to Monday Bible Study. For those online, we have done a kind of a recap of last week. If you were not with us last week, please go back and watch last week's recording. Uh, we are continuing to talk about how, why, what, in what ways can we study the Bible. Uh, and, 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 and we're excited today to be able to do that in a new way for some people. So on your screen, you will see on your paper, you will see um, a spiritual exercise called Lecto Divina. So it comes from the Latin, which means divine reading, and it is an ancient spiritual um, practice that Christians have been doing uh, since the Middle Ages onward. So especially in terms of some of our uh, Christian brothers in ancient traditions, it would have been done by the monks. <coughs> And then eventually others would have adopted it as well. So today we're going to use it as a way of, of talking about how do we slow down and how do we read and reflect on Scripture and allow the Spirit to talk to us as we read. So for some people this will be something that you get really excited about. For other people it may be harder for you to do. It takes practice. It's called a spiritual exercise because you have to practice it over and over. How many of y'all like to exercise physically? Not a lot of hands are being raised, a couple. <laughs> but you know that exercise takes time. You have to have discipline to exercise. You know, you can run a little bit the first time, but if you continue to run, you can keep running farther. In the same way with our, our spiritual lives, if we're not practicing the disciplines, of prayer and reading and fasting and uh, discerning and all the, the ways that we connect to God and we ask God to reveal God's self to us and how we're supposed to live, what is God's will for our life. If we don't practice those things, those disciplines, you know, our spiritual muscles atrophy. So I'm giving you permission to start working out. <clears throat> You know, if you've, if you've ever asked the question, why do, that, why, do, why do they seem more spiritual than me? Well, when I look at somebody that's got a lot more muscles than me, I might say, well, why do they have more muscles than me? Well, the realization is, guess what? They've been working out. If you want to know how to become more spiritual, simple. You've got to work on it. This it doesn't happen. So today we're going to look at, at one way of reading Scripture. We'll talk about some other ways that we can maybe do this. Um, so the, the, it comes in four movements. Lecto Divina comes in four movements. Okay? So what you have to do is identify a section of Scripture that you're going to read. What I would recommend is that every week you're going to have in the bulletin at our church a passage of Scripture for the next week, our sermon text. Most of the time it's written correctly. Sometimes we've misprinted. Sorry, Catherine. But most time it's written correctly. But So what you could do is to take that text, or it might be your Sunday school passage. You know, if you've, if you've used in a curriculum for Sunday school, use that. You could use both. But instead of just reading it once, take this exercise and do it maybe a couple times during the week. Okay? A lot of times I would recommend before you read anything outside of the Scripture, do the exercise. So if you've got your um, Sunday school literature, see what the passage is, read it with this Lecto Divina so that it seeks in more before you read the commentary or whatever else is in the lesson. That way you're coming to hear the Scripture on Sunday morning already kind of, your, your pump has already been primed. Okay? Um, you can also do this with a group. So with your Sunday school classes, with the spouse, with the friend. Um, we're going to do it together today, and I'm going to ask you questions afterwards, and you'll hear other people's responses to the text. Um, so it, it's four, it's in four movements. Our first movement is the first reading of the passage. So most of the time we come to the passage, you've, maybe you've heard it before, uh, maybe it's something you've read and studied before, but I'm going to ask you to pretend like you've never read it before. Okay? 
Come to the passage as fresh as you can. Try to put anything you think you know about the passage to the side just for a little bit. You can bring it back later. And what you're going to do in that first reading, you're going to read slow and you're going to read with an intentional ear and intentional heart. I recommend to read out loud when you do this. So if you don't want to read out loud in front of other people, go somewhere quiet. But read it out loud. Sometimes when we read out loud, we hear stuff even with our ears as we're reading it. Okay? Read it out loud with intentional ears and heart. And what you're going to do as you read, you're going to ask yourself, what phrase, what word, what sentence in this passage sticks out to me? What's, what, what sticks out to me? It could be a word, it could be a phrase, it could be a sentence. And after you read it through the first time, take hold of that word or that phrase and just for a moment or two, just repeat it over and over in your mind or even out loud. You can circle it in your Bible or highlight it or write it on a piece of paper. Then what I want you to do is before you do anything else, prayerfully consider that word, that phrase, that sentence. So what we're essentially doing is praying along with the Scripture. We're doing two things. We're studying Scripture not for study's sake, but we're doing it prayerfully to ask God, God, what would you reveal to me about this, this passage today about my life? The second reading, as you read the second time slowly again, Reflect on that word or that sentence that, that held your attention the first time. Ask yourself, as you prayerfully consider with God, what is this word, what is this phrase meaning to me today? As you reflect on it prayerfully, write down what are your thoughts, what are your emotions, what are your concerns? What's coming to your mind about this passage? What is it saying to your life today? As you reflect on that, you'll come to a third reading of the text. I want you to read the passage for a third time. This time you're going to do something different. Is this all in one sitting or at different times? I would do it in one sitting, so you need uh, 30 minutes at least. It's, this isn't a quick exercise. The third time, I want you to imagine wherever you're sitting that Jesus is sitting there with you. I want you to imagine you know that Christ is with you. So just however you want to imagine Jesus sitting there with you. Okay? And as you imagine in praying to Jesus, prayer is a conversation, prayerfully ask Jesus, why is this part of this passage, whatever the word, the phrase, why is it making you feel the way you feel? Could be conviction. Could be thanksgiving. It could be praise. It could be something that you weren't expecting to come out of this. And just imagine Jesus sitting there. And respond to Christ in prayer. And part of the prayer is listening. A lot of times we pray and we, we say what we want to to God and then we say amen and we move on. This is quiet listening and discernment of the Spirit talking to you. Most of us move too quickly in reading Scripture and in praying. You've got to slow down. After you have listened to the Spirit of Christ in the moment, 
Read the passage a final time. This time, as you read and after you read, begin to relax and rest in God's presence. Calm your heart, still your mind, and faithfully just again listen. Allow yourself to, to feel God's presence around you. Part of what you're doing is you're saying, this time I've spent with God in prayerful reflection of Scripture is like a child who is being fed by a parent. And in that nourishment, after you've eaten, what do you do after you eat? You get what? You rest. You can imagine being a child and God holding you and rocking you in a restful kind of way. Just as a child rests in a parent's arms after being fed, you are resting in the Heavenly Father after you are being spiritually fed in this process. This is a different way to read Scripture than for Bible study. It's not the way we do it in here every week. This is for you. This is not for you to, to do and then go teach a class on the passage. This is just for you. You know, if you were to, to go slowly about reading Scripture in this way as a spiritual practice, what you're doing every time you come to the Scripture and do this practice, and there's other ways to read Scripture, and you should read them other ways, like we do in here. But this is a prayerful reading. You are asking God to reveal something to you in the moment. And you will be surprised the more you do it what God reveals. But it's for you. So there are a few graphics there to kind of help you think about it. You're reading with the heart. You're reflecting with the mind. You are responding in the spirit and you are resting in your body. On the back side you can see the, uh, the Latin there. The lecto is to read. You know, read several times, be attentive to detail, note verses or phrases that stand out. Uh, meditate, think about what you're reading, connecting to your life, imagine being present to hear the passage or witness the story. Uh, orte, pray, dialogue with God in prayer about the passage. Thank God for God's Word. Ask God to lead you to a deeper understanding. And then contemplate quiet expression of love between you and God. Note what God is trying to teach you through the passage in your time of prayer. Um, this is something that, that takes time to develop and do. You're not going to be able to do it all the time, every day. But if you'll begin to practice it, you'll, you'll notice that it is an enjoyable experience. Next week, and we're going to practice this. Next week I'm going to bring to you a different passage, one I've learned probably about a decade ago. And I do it some, especially during preparation for certain things. And it's a completely different way to do Scripture. And it uses your imagination as much as you can use it. Most of us, as the older we grow, we stop using our imagination. How many of y'all still daydream? Daydream as much as you can. I love to daydream. Some of my best thoughts come when I'm daydreaming. It's not when I'm stuck in front of a commentary or... And it usually happens around the house when I'm washing dishes or doing something mundane, getting ready in the mornings. That's when my mind starts to wander. And I've learned to allow my mind to wander as much as it can towards God and not towards other things. That's the hard part. A lot of times we daydream towards our hobbies or the things we, for me, food. <laughs> um, you know, daydream towards the, 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 the fish camp coming Friday maybe. <laughs> you know, how good that's going to be. It's only Monday. But allow ourselves to continually put our mental and emotional energy towards God. 
The more we do that, that is a life of prayer. It's not just sitting down and folding your hands and thanking God for a meal or when somebody asks you, will you pray for somebody? That's prayer too. But prayer is a lifestyle of constantly communicating with God and listening for God to communicate back. Sometimes it comes through Scripture. Sometimes it comes in other ways. And we'll, we may do a whole study about prayer another time. But I'm offering you a resource to pray. So, you had some homework. We had uh, several passages. So let's pick one of our passages today. Um, we had Exodus 12, Deuteronomy 6, Exodus 28 and following, and we had... Uh, the Lord's Supper in Matthew and then in uh, 1 Corinthians. So, when y'all read, which, which of those passages stood out to you the most? Maybe something you, you, you read and it just kind of, you never heard it that way or you never thought of it that way. Any, any of those passages stand out to you that you read this week? Y'all pick us one. Focusing on the Sabbath. Okay. So let's turn to Exodus 20. Everybody turn your, your Bibles to Exodus 20, and we're going to do a Lecto Divina with Exodus 20 today. Exodus chapter 20, and I'll give you the verse numbers here in just a second. So Exodus chapter 20, we are in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 begins... Um, with God speaking to Israel through Moses um, and the center of the Ten Commandments is the Fourth Commandment. We may not think of the Fourth Commandment as the center because it's not number five, but it is the bridge commandment. It is the commandment that bridges love of God and love of neighbor. How are we going to live with God? How is Israel who has been taken out of bondage in Egypt, been given a new identity, not just ancestors to Abraham and Jacob and Isaac, but now they are the people that God has chosen and liberated and moving towards the promised land. And the Exodus was a free thing God gave. They didn't do anything to deserve being saved, just like us. But they are taken into the wilderness and God says, I want, you, I want to be your God and you to be my people. And to do that, we're going to live in relationship with one another. And here are the relationship terms. I'm the Lord your God, brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourselves an idol, whether in form of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, worship them, for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the iniquity of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But steadfast love to those, to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. So you shouldn't have no other gods before me. Don't make graven idols and don't use, what? The Lord's name in vain. We know those. The fourth commandment is what we're going to look at specifically now. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read it out loud. I'm going to read it slowly. I want you to listen to a word or a phrase that sticks out to you. Once you've got it, write it down. I know all of us getting a little older. Maybe they'll come to us and write it down. Okay? I look in that direction. That direction. So we're going to do this slowly. I want you to listen as though you've never heard this commandment before. Now, part of what I want you to do is something normally I wouldn't tell you to do, but remember the story of the Exodus. Remember the story. Remember the story of a, of a people who cried out for God to save them. 
And what were they being saved from? Pharaoh who was doing what? Working them to what? Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and consecrated it. What word or phrase or sentence grabs your attention? Take it and hold it and repeat it in your mind. As you hold it, prayerfully consider the word or the phrase or sentence. And ask the question, God, what would you have me to know? may move a little quicker than you would normally do, but let's do a second reading. As we read a second time, I want you to focus as we hear the text again to that word or phrase or sentence. As you hear it, what are your emotions? What are your concerns today? What is coming to your mind as you consider the passage? It could be anything. As it comes to your mind, write it down and begin to reflect prayerfully on what it is that you're hearing. Our second reading. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and consecrated it. What are your thoughts, emotions, or concerns that come to your mind? What is this passage saying to you today?
As we read a third time, and I know we're moving quicker than some of you would like. But I just want you to close your eyes and listen as I read. As your eyes are closed, I want you to imagine you are in your special place. Could be your living room, could be your dining room table, wherever it is that you feel the most comfortable. And imagine you are sitting and Jesus is sitting with you. And as you listen for our third reading, following our reading, I want you to prayerfully ask Jesus, what are you trying to say to me in this moment, through this passage? And take time to listen. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Respond now in a time of prayer with Christ. On our last reading of the text, I want you to allow yourself to be still and calm. I want you to feel God's presence in you and around you. I want you to listen with the deepest part of your heart to what God's Spirit is saying. And allow yourself to be at rest in God's presence. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. 
For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that it is in them, but rested the seventh day. And therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Take a few moments just to rest in God's presence. Amen. So how many of y'all found that hard? How many of it was a little different? A little different. How many of y'all enjoyed it? Okay. When you read the passage that you're familiar with in a different way, what are... For those that are willing to share, what, what was a word or a phrase or a sentence that stuck out to you? The word not. Okay. Not? The word not. Not? Not showed up in all the commandments was not the one word. Okay. Okay. How about others? Remember. Remember? Remember. Mine was rest with God. Rest with God. Okay. Because I don't think we do that. No. I Keep it holy. Keep it holy. So from your word, if you're willing to share, how was it how was the spirit speaking to you through the reading? Was there anything that, that came to you that, that helped you kind of sense something in your life that you needed in that moment? Anybody that's willing to share? It, what it did is it, it instantly a picture came into my mind of when I was growing up and I would be at my grandmother's house compared to a Sunday at my house now. Yeah. Because it was going to church, coming home and eating. Everybody was there. You were either visiting and sitting around and loving on one another or you were visiting someone yeah as opposed to what I would do now is go out to eat come home and watch football or watch the television all that yeah, I mean the two pictures just came into my mind yeah. instantly yeah and those days were my at my grandma's house those were Beyond, I can't even explain how much they meant and go back and remember them. Yeah. They stand out. Anybody else? Maybe in your town. We all, especially Sunday afternoon, we go to see that alien resident who's cooking dinner for us. Yeah. So do you not attend those restaurants or places that sell things? Hmm. Very good question. And I do work on Sunday if I feel like I have to, and I know it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I have some washing to do okay. or something, I, I do it, mm -hmm. and I know it's wrong. But uh, i got to spend more time praying about that. Well, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of these. Anybody else? When I was 
looking about the one about the seven day resting thing, you know. Well, when I tried to cut grass on Sunday, my little more broke. I was telling me not to cut grass on Sunday. So the spirit, spirit, I just I didn't even, I had to put the on. So here's what I want to do. I want to look at this text as much from the devotional, but I want us to go back to the, the three things, the narrative, the formation, and the engagement. Okay? So what is the story of the Sabbath? I want us to think about it. Now, I did a whole doctoral work on Sabbath, so you got this. I want you to think about God has taken... A group of people and said, I want you to, I'll be your God, you will be my people. Now part of that is, God wants the people to not only be his people, but eventually those people are going to represent God to the nations. The idea is always that God is using Israel for the redemption of the world. They are to attract others to the one God. The creator of heaven and earth. Okay? That's their intention. How are they going to do it? They've got to be what? Like God. So God says, you should have never the gods for me, all the, the three. The bridge is this. Notice the word, remember. We talked about last week, we get in amnesia very quickly. God's people get amnesia very quick. God gives the Decalogue, and a few chapters later, they're building a graven idol. They forget quickly. Jesus has told the disciples over and over again, this is what's going to happen. They don't show up on Easter Sunday ready for a miracle. Because they don't remember. We as God's people forget quickly too. Remembering is more than just remembering. It is taking the memory and living it out. In action on a weekly basis. The memory is this. God is not like Pharaoh. Pharaoh's narrative was this. You are here for the purpose of pleasing me. And the way you will please me is you will work and you will work and you will work. Your value is only in what? Work. And God says, I am not like Pharaoh. In six days I created... And on the seventh day, I rested. God's not a workaholic. What's the purpose of creating a wonderful and good creation if you don't do what? Enjoy it. Enjoy it. So God says to Israel, I am not like Pharaoh, and you will not be like Pharaoh either. And the way this is going to happen is once a week you will take a day and you will set it aside, set it apart, you will make it holy. And on that day, you will not work. You won't make your children work. You won't make your slaves and your servants work. And the immigrants that come in and out of your land who are vulnerable, you will not use them as a commodity for work the way Pharaoh used you. They were the alien resident. God says when people come into your, your new region in life, you will not become like Pharaoh to them. So the narrative is this. This is the way the world tells you it should be. Work, 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 work. Produce, produce, produce. Not only that, you take other people and livestock and the land and you get as much out of it as you can and you don't really worry about their consequences versus a God who says no no 
You will not view the world and others and yourself that way. Now we get to the time of Jesus and it becomes legalistic for the Pharisees. We can take anything good and make it legalistic. But God is setting His people aside and saying, you will be a unique and different people. You will take on a new narrative about life that is not like the narrative of Pharaoh. And if you live in that, guess what's going to happen? You know, there was a, when I was doing my, my research, there was a doctor who almost killed himself overworking. He's a Christian, began to think about Sabbath, and wrote a book called 24-7. It's a good book. But he wrote in there, just kind of hit me as I was reading it, the average lifespan of an American these days is around 77, give or take. Some of y'all are doing really good. <laughs> You beating the average. I'm gonna take you to. I'm gonna take you down to uh, Cherokee. We're gonna let it ride. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but imagine if in your life you took a seventh of that and consecrated it to God in some way or another. Maybe like Israel did on the Sabbath. Maybe it was in a different way of resting, renewing, connecting to God. You would have spent 11 years of your life doing that. Think about how transformational 11 years of your life doing the one thing that everybody else in the world's not doing. This is Israel's uniqueness. Because it bridges, yes, I'm going to love God, to I'm going to love my neighbor, I'm going to honor my mother and my father, I'm not going to murder, I'm not going to commit adultery, I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to bear false witness, I'm not going to covet. How do we do that? How do we love God and love our neighbor as ourselves? We can't do it if we don't remember why we're doing what we're doing. It comes down to the why, and God does not want Israel to forget why are you worshiping me? Why are you living in a relationship with your neighbors that looks after your neighbor above yourself? The why is because God has done this and God is unique. God has liberated you and given you a new reality to live in. So when Jesus looks at his disciples and says, Remember me when... Why are we going to remember Jesus? Because we're going, to, we're going to know the story of Jesus is a story that models the same God that comes out of the Exodus event. A God who liberates and redeems and is commissioning the disciples to go out into the world to share the good news with the world. But you know what? Life gets busy. And there's obstacles, and there's persecution, and there's all the other stuff that comes with the early church. And if they're not regularly meeting together and remembering what it is to love God in Christ and love their neighbor as themselves, Jesus pulls down the commandments and the prophets and the writings, all of it together, those two commands. If you forget, if you don't remember... So when we come to Scripture over and over again, part of what we're doing is remembering the story of God. Taking that story and allowing it to become a part of us so that we can go out and live out that story with others. Israel is asked, you live this out not just with you, but with your children and your servants and slaves, and even the immigrants that come through your town. You are announcing to them the story of God when you practice Sabbath. But when you stop practicing, guess what happens? You not only forget, you revert. Notice how many times in our lives that we've, we've forgotten. And it's usually not intentional. It's a little bit by little bit. 
And we come to a place and we ask the <coughs> hard questions, how did we get so far from where we were? Israel's going to go through the wilderness for 40 years after this. Why? Because they don't remember what God has done and when God gives them an opportunity to do something, they become afraid and they forget God's work already. <coughs> and God lets them wonder in, for another generation to remember. Why do we read our Bible? We do it in part to remember. But in the remembering, it comes a part of who we are and we begin to live it out in the world around us so that others can meet the story of God through our lives. You may go to a restaurant on Sunday. I do sometimes too. How can you in that moment Look at the people that are working around you and see them. Don't let them become invisible. Pharaoh doesn't care. He allows people to become invisible. They're just numbers on what? A worksheet. That's the way it was when I was a designer and manager of a florist. Especially the Jews because Saturdays are Sabbath. But they would make us. I <laughs> mean, I would have had to close the store down had I not done what they wanted to because I didn't own the store. But anyway, they would insist on having their weddings on Sunday because that was not their side. Yeah. And other people too, not just the Jews. Yeah. But anyway, uh, when I was you were reading this over and over, I was just thinking that I could have refused to work, you know, but I wouldn't have had a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't have been respected as a designer yeah. or anything like that. And like you said about the people at the restaurant having to work, I know how they felt uh, or feel. And so, I, but it's not so, just on Sunday, it's every day. Every day, and my day off, yeah. they call me all day yeah. to want my nose off. So I didn't have a yeah. day off. Here's the thing, Israel's going to get the opportunity that they're going to eventually become a kingdom. And when the prophets come to them, why are the prophets so upset? Why is God so upset with Israel? Because they become just like Pharaoh. They have forgotten the orphans and the widows. They are oppressing people. They are stealing. They are weighing the scales. They are hurting people financially. And the people are working and working themselves to death. Why does God get upset with Israel? Because they've forgotten. For us as followers of Jesus, sometimes it is just to recognize those around us as people made in the image of God and when we have power over them whether it is as a customer as a consumer as an employer is to say to ourselves when we have an opportunity to be with them let us be as God to them representing God the story of God to them if somebody has worked hard pay them what they're don't try to skimp If you know the person waiting on you on Sunday is working for tips, don't be cheap. When you buy the clothes you wear at Walmart, which I do because I'm cheap. <laughs> Amber says that's why they don't last. The recognition is, think about all the people that went into making that piece of garment. And some of them were not treated very well. When you eat produce, 
most of the produce you are eating from the grocery store has been picked by an alien resident. It has gone from hand to hand to hand to your table and you didn't do a whole lot to get it. Take a moment and thank God for the people that you do not know that have touched the meal you're about to eat. And the person that has to go into work for flowers, put flowers on Sunday for a funeral. You work half the night and mm -hmm. people have to have funerals on Sunday. Mm. Don't take for granted the people around you. This is part of what the remembering is. Jesus says, treat others the way you want to be treated. America could l learn a little bit about that. We are some of the most entitled folks. And part of it is because we are affluent. We don't feel affluent. But if you want to go anywhere else in the world, you'll know you're affluent. You go to Haiti, been to Haiti. We're affluent. I have never had to sweep out my house and you look down and there's just dirt. <clears throat> you know, I said when we went there in 2012, the last night we were there, we were in an orphanage and on a little black and white TV with rabbit ears, they were watching the, the wedding of uh, Princess Kate and William. These little Haitian orphans are watching a princess and a prince get married in all the elegance. They're dreaming about what that would be because they'll never know. Some of them might not even be alive today. And, and in that moment, you kind of get a sense of something's wrong in the world. This is the way God might be seeing the world in this moment. You know, the word remember might be a good one just to put on the refrigerator. Just walk by and just that one word during the day, we make us stop and think about something, not that maybe something different every day, but I can see we don't we go about a day and so it's so easy just to forget. So in, in Deuteronomy, we're, we're going to quick, quickly finish. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, you were supposed to read that too, uh, verses 4 and following. So in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy essentially kind of rehashes parts of the Exodus story in a little bit more detail in some areas and some explanations. But Deuteronomy has already uh, told about the commandments of God here. And we hear in, in, in verse 4, what eventually would become the Shema, comes from the Hebrew, hear. The Shema becomes a prayer of Israel. So the time you get to Jesus, this is a common prayer that most Israelites would pray every day. So chapter 6, verses 4 of Deuteronomy. I just want you to listen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord God with all of your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them on an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Why? So you do not forget. <clears throat> Remember. Remember, O Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. 
Recite these commandments I am telling you to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're away. Write them all over you if you need to. So you don't what? Forget. Because amnesia takes, it comes quickly. It comes quickly. Israel over and over again will worship other gods. Why? Because they forget so quickly. We worship other gods too sometimes. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it's our relationships. Sometimes it's good things. Sometimes it can be even church. But if we forget the why of what we're doing, the why of God, the why of Jesus, that God has come to rescue us and liberate us and to give us a new reality, a new way of living, and to take that new way of living and to share it with everyone around us. This Sunday, um, I'll be preaching and uh, I'll talk about that in a sec. Let me, let me pray for those that are with us online. I hope you'll join us Sunday. Um, you'll be getting a sermon. I won't say if it's a good sermon, a bad sermon. It'll be a sermon. Uh, but we're going to do some little things differently on Sunday, so I hope that you'll join us. Um, let me close this in prayer, and then for those that are here, if we need to talk a few minutes, we can. Gracious God, we thank you for the time we've had today. God, we thank you for moments that we can step aside and reflect and renew ourselves in you. Lord, we thank you for your word that helps us to know who you are. But in knowing you, help us to remember the why. Allow your word to become a part of every fiber of our being so that we can live out your story in our relationships, in our community, in our church and the wider world. Lord, guide us this week as we continue to prayerfully read Scripture. And as we listen to where you are leading us. And Lord, when we encounter other stories about what our life's supposed to be like, help us remember. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.